it's uh, very apropos that we're having this conversation this week because just last week was the launch of Visual Studio 2013. And while it looks like that's just another release, there's actually a ton of new stuff in the tool as well as kind of surrounding it in .NET and um, some stuff in the cloud that I'm sure we'll talk about. Now, if you think back to maybe a year ago when Windows 8 came out, we were, we were at the conference, uh, the build conference then, it just, I don't know, things felt a little less loving towards developers in the Microsoft world. So, I don't know, is this, a, is this a figment of my imagination, of our imagination, or is Microsoft getting more um, back in touch with the .NET developer, do you think? What's the, what's the kind of balance politically and, and rhetorically uh, towards .NET developers specifically? What do you think? Um, I think if you look back at the first build conference that Microsoft had, which I think that was like two years ago, two, three years ago, it kind of felt like war on .NET developers had been declared to me. Um, I, I think the .NET developers who were there really felt unloved. Um, they felt like all the attention was on the HTML5 JavaScript developers, and that Microsoft had kind of forgotten about their loyalist constituents. Um, cut now to build this past year, Microsoft execs were up on the stage apologizing to the .NET developers, which was unprecedented, and I was very surprised to see it happen. But it needed to happen. You look at what was built for the Windows Store, for Windows 8, and the majority of the apps in the store are C, Sharp, and .NET apps. They are not HTML and JavaScript apps. And I think it was kind of like Microsoft tried to lead the, the uh, .NET developers to water, but they did not drink. Uh, and, so and remem remember, in the weeks leading up to that first build conference in 2011, people were worried .NET was going away completely. Right. Right? It turned, right. That turned out to be a little bit true in the case of Silverlight. Yeah. Maybe we'll talk about that later. But, I mean, yeah. there, was, there was panic. There was. So then there was relief that the ultimate doomsday scenario hadn't come to fruition, right. but it still felt a little raw. Yeah. So... I mean, do you think where we are now is, is that a trend or is that just kind of a, a one-off? I, I think and I hope it's a trend. Um, I think there's been a changing of the guard on the Windows team, um, and I think we're going to talk about that a little bit, perhaps. Um, and I think that's very good news for developers. It feels like the split between the Windows division and the developer division at Microsoft is somewhat healed, or at least they're trying to heal it. And I think it's really important that that happens because Microsoft really just cannot ignore the .NET developers and expect to build Windows into a platform that has any kind of a growth path. Agreed. All right, let's talk about something a little different but, but ultimately related. So of course when Windows 8 came out, we really got two versions of Windows, right? We got, we got what was being called WOA, Windows on ARM, and became Windows RT and we got the full-blown Intel-based Windows 8. And there were a bunch of OEMs lined up for Windows RT. I think in addition to what, well, Microsoft became its own REM when the Surface plans were revealed. But I think Dell was on there. Um, I think Acer was on there. Yep. There were at least four. Mm -hmm. And one by one, they've dropped out, such that the only OEMs left doing Windows RT are Microsoft itself, and Nokia, mm -hmm. which Microsoft is about to purchase, right. God willing. <laughs> um, so what's going on with Windows RT? Is it, do you, I mean, do you think it has a future? And let's also remember there's one other version of Windows for ARM, mm -hmm. which is Windows Phone. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, maybe those are mutually exclusive questions, maybe not. What's, okay. what's your take there? So this might not be something people in the audience want to hear, but Windows RT is the future of Windows at Microsoft. It's not going to go away. Um, in fact, they're going to keep boosting that platform. I, the, everybody I talk to 
uh, around the company says, nope, it's not going away, and they're just going to keep at it until it becomes a success. And now here's why. This, this is more interesting, actually. I don't think I want to hear that either. Okay, sorry. <laughs> um, the reason why is they didn't build um, Windows RT only to pressure Intel, which is what some people think. You know, they, they use that as a way to say to Intel, look, if you don't do what we want, we're going to go all ARM. That isn't I, what they I. do. I.e. produce CPUs that don't drain the battery in two hours? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Those kind of things. Um, Small but stuff. yeah, but instead, you know, they when they built WOA, and this is something they've been building for years, by the way. There, there actually was the very first efforts I knew about to port Windows to ARM was when they were doing Vista. <laughs> they they had a port called Longhorn, um, then Longhorn on ARM, and um, believe it or not, they that actually almost came to market. So they've been at this for a while, and they believe that the reason they needed to re-architect Windows was to kind of prevent like Windows rot. You know how Windows gets slower and slower over time. They wanted to make it more secure. They wanted to make it um, something that they could control that, through the Windows Store and really lock down. And they believe this is an admirable goal and they think this is where they can put their attention in the future to really further the platform. So about your question on Windows Phone. Yeah. Now if you look what's just happened at Microsoft this year, um, there's been a major reorg inside the company. They unified all of the operating systems teams, and the person who's in charge is Terry Meyerson, who ran Windows Phone. So the Windows Phone team now is, get, is getting quite a bit of power at Microsoft, and I think what's going to happen is they're going to take the Windows Phone OS and the Windows RT OS and somehow make these into a single OS. The question is, is it going to be more um, like Windows Phone OS, or is it going to be more like Windows RT? And that's the part we don't know, but I think whatever comes of that is going to be what they push forward as the main platform uh, for Windows going, going into the future. Uh, I mean, perhaps just a follow up there, perhaps the most uh, prominent difference between RT and Windows Phone, to, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to, aside from form factor differences, is that Windows Phone has no desktop. Right. And Windows RT still does, mm -hmm. and in fact, that's still where Office is running. Mm -hmm. So will we see, do you think, a version of Windows for large form factors where the desktop just isn't there at all anymore? Yes. Um, this is going to happen. And I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later. Yeah. If you look at what they did with the um, Surface 2, by the way, you know, the new version of the Surface, ARM-based Surface, they don't, by default, have the desktop on there. There's no tile There's no for desktop the desktop tile. by default. Right. So those apps that you have that open in the desktop, they're still there. They're just pinned as desktop apps. So they're kind of moving that way, getting people used to the idea that, yeah, you don't really need the desktop, and we don't really think the desktop is going to be there forever. Um, my, my guess, I don't know if I'd call it educated or not, um, is that at some point there's going to be a dividing line. Either it's going to be like consumption devices have no desktop or it's going to be a certain size screen doesn't have the desktop. I'm not sure which way that will go, but I think they are going to pull the plug on the desktop on ARM. I mean, I would say right now if you get one of those 8-inch tablets, mm -hmm. there's, well, I guess there's really only one, right? right. Which is that, that uh, Acer one, and you try and use the mm -hmm. desktop with your, with your finger, yeah. It's kind of tough. Well, you know, the, the other thing you need, right, is office apps that are built for ARM, um, that are mm -hmm. touch-first ARM-based apps. And these are coming. Um, these are going to be coming next year. They're, they're pretty well along the path towards the development of that. So once you have that, then you have much less of a need, I'd say, for a desktop, at least on ARM. How many in the audience are still doing some kind of desktop development, be it Windows Forms, WPF, or Silverlight? Yep. <laughs> Almost half, maybe? Yep. Yeah. Yep. All right. Well, we'll see how that goes down. Right. <laughs> when that next version of Whenever Windows comes happens. out with no <laughs> desktop, if I can read between the lines. I don't, I don't think it'll be maybe the next version. It's hard to say when, right? Yeah. Well, it's hard to say what a version is now, right? I know. Since is it going to be 2.9? Is yeah. it going to be 2015? We don't really know. Exactly. Um, all right. A I mean, speaking of no desktop, let's talk about the cloud a little bit. And let's mm -hmm. talk about it specifically in the context of developer tools. Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that got introduced last week with the release of Visual Studio 2013 is this thing that's still codenamed 
which means you've got to be all over it because you, you like you like you some code, like names. code names. I like the code names. Do you still do the, you used to have a thing where you, you had an updated catalog of no. Microsoft Codename projects? I got to redo that. I used to, I used to track all the code names at Microsoft, active and past code names, and have it like in, a, in an Excel spreadsheet, but I haven't done that in a while. All right. It's kind of fun. I you should bring it back maybe. Yeah. All right, listen. So the code name is Monaco. Right. And it's, uh, Microsoft's very careful not to call it an IDE. Mm -hmm. Don't call it an IDE. Right. It's a editing, it's a coding environment. It's a development environment and it's browser based. Yeah, wow. You can do, you can do various kinds of development including, well it's really geared to Windows Azure websites which means mm -hmm. ASP.NET, yep. but it works with PHP as well I think mm -hmm. and a couple of other things. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I don't know. We could look at this a couple of ways, right? This could just be a neat trick and I do remember a couple of years ago, some little company had came out with a, you know, color syntax, browser-based editor, and there were people in the community saying Microsoft should do something like that. Mm -hmm. So here, here we are in 2013, and they did. But is, I mean, is this, is this something we're going to see more of, do you think? Do, 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 I mean, boy, there's... Silverlight was about running stuff in the browser, although it was a plugin, and then plugins became bad. So, mm -hmm. are we are we looking at the browser to be maybe the next platform for Microsoft? Yeah, Mo Monaco is really interesting. They announced this last week. Um, Andrew was there with me. We were at the uh, VS twenty thirteen launch in New York, and. One of the people I got to interview there was Eric Gama, and you guys probably know who he is. You know, Gang of Four, the guy who used to work on Eclipse tools at IBM. Well, Microsoft hired him two years ago. It was, it was a very high profile hire, but they never said what the guy was going to do when he came to Microsoft. So we found out last week, he came to Microsoft to build Monaco. And he, uh, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, we, we had a green field kind of a thing. They said to me, we want you to do online development tools, whatever that means. And so they looked at a lot of different things. They looked at how, to, how that could supplement Visual Studio. They decided not to try to replace it, I think, which was smart. Um, it's definitely a complement to Visual Studio. And you know, Microsoft has been saying there's going to be a cloud complement to every single product we build. So this is the cloud complement to Visual Studio. Um, what's, what's very interesting to me is, yes, the first version of it is for Azure websites, for editing Azure websites, but he told me this is a toolbox, and we have a whole bunch of things we didn't even announce that we're going to drop, be able to drop in and pull out of this toolbox, and so we're going to have a lot of other things that you can do with this besides just editing Azure websites. It's already uh, got some applicability with the NAPA tools that Microsoft has for office development. There's a piece of that that's Monaco. Um, he said there's a piece of TFS that's Monaco, and even some of the uh, cloud editing that SkyDrive is doing with file editing, that's also using the Monaco technology. So we didn't even know this was all stuff that he was working on and pieces that were Monaco, but... It's already sounding it's already in there. disturbingly pervasive. Yes, yeah. yes. Hmm. <laughs> um, now, I mean, if we're not going to have desktop apps on ARM, what do you think? Maybe browser mm -hmm. apps using Monaco technology? Yeah. Did, did, was there any tip of a hat or a nod toward that during the interview? Yeah, I asked him about that. I said, so why didn't you instead try to build a modern or a metro style or Windows store, or whatever you're calling it today, one of those apps um, that was Visual Studio, like a modern app Visual Studio? And he said, we looked at that, but we decided these days, if you're doing something with Visual Studio, you almost always want to be connected to the internet. So we said, no, we're not going to build a modern app because that'll give you an offline story and there really shouldn't be one. So that's the, the way they're talking about it is maybe this is how if you have an ARM-based machine and you can't run native Visual Studio on it, at least you could do some editing and other tasks in the browser on, Visual Studio, on the ARM. So that's kind of cool. And you know, the other thing we didn't mention is when they announced Monaco, it doesn't just support Internet Explorer. It supports any modern browser. So I think it also supports Chrome, Firefox, and Safari. So you can do all of these things within those browsers as well. Including Safari on the iPad. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. OK. I know. Getting, getting a little <sighs> crazy. <laughs> we started out on such a good note, too. Sorry. Yeah. <laughs> so I alluded to the Nokia purchase. Let's, let's do more than allude to it now. 
one assumes it's going to close. And when it does, Microsoft will kind of have two divisions making devices with different pedigrees. Uh, I mentioned in the tablet case, both would be running Windows RT. Mm -hmm. But um, boy, first of all, they're different. Mm -hmm. Second of all, they're both kind of on the expensive side. Yeah. The Surface stuff and what we know about um, devices from Nokia, obviously when you get a subsidized phone, you get a subsidized mm -hmm. phone. The prices don't sting that much. But if we're talking yeah. about an unsubsidized tablet, mm -hmm. um, things are looking a little tricky. So yeah. what's your sense on how this may be brought together? Mm -hmm. And if you have any sense on pricing, yeah. throw us a bone. Okay. Yeah, so this is very interesting because when Microsoft said they were going to buy the Nokia mobile division, they obviously they bought the handset, they, or they're going to be buying the handsets, but they're also buying their tablets, right? This, there's this new tablet called the Lumia 2520. As Andrew said, it's based on Windows RT. It's running a Qualcomm Snapdragon processor. It's actually coming out this week. It's going to be out um, on Verizon on Thursday and on AT&T on Friday which means, as you can guess, they have LTE built in, uh, which is very interesting. And I think on Verizon it's going to be $400, but then you have to pay extra for the cover, just like you do for the Surface. So yeah, they're very pricey. The question is, do you need both of these tablets, right? So what's going to be so different between the 2520 and Microsoft Surface 2? How are they going to differenti differentiate them? Are they going to keep both of those in the market? Um, are they going to position one as a consumption device, and one is a creation device, or one is a home and business. It's, we don't really know. We don't have a good sense yet of how, how they're going to try to separate those out, or even if they'll keep both of them in the market. Do, do you think Microsoft knows? I don't know. I actually don't know if they know. We don't know if they know. <laughs> um, you know, and then what makes things even more interesting is the convergence of screen sizes beyond that, right? So we know Microsoft's also building a mini Surface. Uh, that's supposed to be an eight-inch surface that comes out next year, um, probably early, like springtime. Um, but then Nokia is building bigger devices like this that I'm not supposed to show you right here that I have in my hand. This is the big-ass phone. Have you guys seen this? <laughs> the sixth-inch um, Lumia 1520 that's coming out this that's week. That's a Windows phone. This right? is a Windows phone. Yeah. It's big. <laughs> so it has no desktop. Has no desktop. Right. No keyboard. Right. All right. Yeah, so then when you get into that, you've got, okay, eight inch devices, six inch phones, tablets, mini tablets, and then there's rumors that Nokia also is building a mini tablet as well. So it's going to be interesting to see what Microsoft does with this portfolio of devices. I don't really know what's going to survive. I don't know what's going to happen with pricing. I hope they cut some of these prices because even the Surface, uh, Surface 2 is still pretty expensive at $450 plus the cover. And every single ad, pretty much, yeah. for the Surface has, has a keyboard. It does. In the photo. I can't really use, I have a Surface RT. I, I never use it without the keyboard. I know yeah. some people do, but I never use mine without it. Yeah, and I mean, it, it, there seems to be no sign of surrender. I, the, mm -mm. the ads are everywhere. I, they are. I, have you seen them on the subway in New yeah. York now? I know. They're they doing are like everywhere. The, in the, the in brand New York. trains, it says this is not a tablet. Yep. This, is not, mm -hmm. this is not a laptop. Yep. Um, I'll just, you know. You can, you, can, you can extrapolate that in your imagination. Uh, let's change subjects slightly. The Q&A we're going to come to at the end. <laughs> but we, we'll have at least 10 or 15 minutes of it, I promise. Um, so we were just talking about browser-based stuff. Yep. So browser-based stuff, I mean, it, you, you said it won't only run in IE, it'll also, also run in the other browsers. I'm starting to expect the reverse. Like, by the way, it runs in IE. Um, yeah. I'm, every yeah. single Windows device I set up, or maybe this is like one blocker to Windows RT, I'm installing Chrome, and I use IE as my mm -hmm. main browser, but I'm installing Chrome because I'm finding more and more sites that don't, that don't come up in IE, and it seems to be a little worse with IE 11. Yeah. Meanwhile, um, I forget which of the analyst firms it was, but the latest browser market share report that came out actually showed that Chrome's share is on the decline, mm -hmm. and IE's is on the rise. It seems like a great moment 
from Microsoft's IE team to get its act together. Yeah. Um, meanwhile, the leader of that team just got shifted to a different role. Yep. Can you fill us in, I guess, on the executive intrigue there? Yeah. And then also, I don't know, from you have a lot of ears to the ground. I mean, what are people saying about about browser compatibility and share and, and where IE is headed? Yeah. So I'll take the, uh, the second part of that first, actually. Fair enough. Um, last week, when I was in New York, the IE team came to New York on a press tour, and I met with them. And I talked to them about this very issue. I, you know, they're out there doing all these blog posts and touting how great IE 11 is and how fast it is and all the new Sun Spider benchmarks and the standards they're supporting. And I said, yeah, but you know, do you, you guys know this, right? Like, a lot of sites don't work with it. And, <laughs> and they, you know what they said? No, we don't know that. And so I said, do you have one? Let's pull it up. Because um, <laughs> uh, <laughs> TweetDeck, uh, YouTube, New York Times. And I just started listing websites. And he said, well, are you reporting all of these? I said, yeah, but I can't be the only one, right? <laughs> And I said, are you blaming the site vendors? Are you saying they're not updating their code? Like, what's going on? And they said, no, we think everything's great. Yeah. But I think maybe he's blaming you for not reporting it. I like, reported like it. It's our, <laughs> like, it's our job to fix the browser. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, and so I was just kind of surprised. And, and I, I don't know what they're thinking there. I, because I get reports all the time from people who are having sites not work there or not work properly, like the scrolling doesn't work. Um, and you know, on my surface, I get a lot of blank tabs coming up when I'm like starting up a site, and it's just a white blank tab. Um, so I don't, I don't really know what to say there because I can't believe I'm the only one who's noticing this, and obviously I'm not. Um, so they just kind of seem to think everything's going to work out. I guess I don't, I don't really know. Um, but yeah, to your point about uh, maybe everything isn't okay, the guy who was the head of IE for nine years, Dean Hakamovich, recently announced he's leaving the team and he's going to be going to a new uh, post inside Microsoft. He wouldn't say what it was, but I heard what he's going to do is work on a telemetry team inside the company. <laughs> <laughs> How kind ironic. of ironic. Um, <laughs> where he's looking at all the data that comes in across Microsoft products and, and kind of helping them discern trends and figure out how to stay ahead of the curve. So his job now, the head of IEE, is not going to be filled. And instead, they're just dividing his tasks up among different people. So wow. um, the JavaScript engine and um, Trident rendering engine, they stay in Windows. And the part of his job that was about user experience and UI is going to Joe Belfiore, who was the Windows phone guy, which is very interesting. So yeah, IE is still there. They're still going forward with it. They're still continu continuing with it, but I don't really know what to is tell Bell you. Is Fury no longer on the Windows he's phone still, team? He is, um, he's on this new unified OS team, so he's still okay. doing Windows Phone and also That's good stuff. Also uh, UX. Nick, yeah. Nick's helping out. He's jealous he doesn't have that phone, I think. I saw the smoke <laughs> coming out of his ears. <laughs> <laughs> Nice. <laughs> Nick, Nick, Nick is our speaker on all things Windows Phone and cross-platform development and typically has the newest device at least, you know, a day or two before it's supposed to come out. So. <laughs> all right. Um, all right. Well, it, now, I mean, nine years is, at Microsoft is a very long time to be in one job. It is. So do you think this was just kind of normal rotation or is there a cause and effect going on? I, I don't really know. Um, I know, I can tell you right now at Microsoft, as I probably don't need, even need to tell anybody in this audience, it's a time of turmoil right now at the company. And there's a lot of changes as far as reorgs and people being moved to new teams. So yeah, it is the time of year when a lot of people get moved around tr traditionally. So it could have just been, it was time for him to move. I can also tell you that every, almost everybody um, in Windows, who is kind of like a big power person on the Windows development team, um, is being shifted off of that team into oblivion. <laughs> really? Yeah. Huh. Um, so, you know, a lot of the people who've been... Is, were, that a, is that a code name for a new product? Or <laughs> you mean they're really being shifted out? <laughs> they, uh, some of them don't have jobs. Some of them are in, looking for jobs inside. These are the people who built Windows 8. Um, so take that as you will. Okay. 
Um, all right, I'm going to take that one step further uh, because the Windows 8 technology seems to have had some influence on this upcoming new version of Xbox, mm -hmm. which yeah. comes out on Thursday, right? So we're, we're like yeah. at the perfect time. Like, what, five days ago we had, no, wait, yeah, five days ago was mm -hmm. the Visual Studio launch and four days hence. Mm -hmm will be the Xbox launch. So I was all excited that Xbox One seems to leverage virtualization, and there, I mean, there seems to be a Windows 8 core in there at least. There is. Mm -hmm. So it should be super easy for me to write apps for Xbox. But if that's true, <laughs> nobody's said so yet. Yeah. What are you hearing? <laughs> uh, I'm, yeah, I'm hearing uh, maybe we won't hear about that for a while longer. Um, I'm not being cryptic. I just, I just think um, they aren't going to talk fully about that developer story for Xbox possibly until early next year. And I think the reason for that is they're waiting to be able to talk about Windows Phone as well and talk about all the platforms at the same time. So right now, we know, here's what we know about Xbox One developer story. We know Xbox One is built on the Windows 8 core. We know Dave Cutler of NT and VMS fame is the guy who built the OS, which is very interesting. It uses Hyper-V in the Xbox to actually switch stuff between games and, and uh, apps. And you know, when, they, when you talk about apps on the Xbox, I had somebody ask me the other day, does this mean I can build, this person really said this, can I build a CRM app for the Xbox? No. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no, although maybe not always no. I don't know. Um, you, I mean, you've got IE on the Xbox, right? You've got SkyDrive on the Xbox. You've got Bing on the Xbox. So you've got all these piece parts. Uh, I don't think you're going to see CRM on the Xbox, but yay, never say never. I, but I do think you know they're building this, this story where they're having the common core, the co more common set of developer tools, the more common user interface. They've talked about having this more common platform to make it easier for people who want to build across all of these platforms. Um, so yeah, I think my guess is they're waiting till we see Windows Phone Blue, which is Windows Phone 8.1, we think, um, early next year. Uh, and then at that point, they'll be able to talk more about how all of these things are kind of coming together a bit more closely. Can I run Monaco on the Xbox? There is yeah. a version of IE for you the You can, Xbox. probably. All right, so right? maybe with the little keyboard attachment on the, on the controller, yeah. we can do if some If you want to. <laughs> if you um, really want to. How many here are planning to buy an Xbox One for the holiday season? Wow. How about uh, PlayStation 4? <laughs> All right, well, yeah. let the record show. It wasn't a lot of hands in either case, but I yeah. think it was about double for um, PS4 yeah. versus XB1. Um, all right. Well, let's talk a little bit more about the executive shuffle. Mm -hmm. Obviously, at the very top, we have a change, right? Um, right. Steve mm -hmm. Ballmer, CEO, since 01. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people don't realize he was CEO way before Bill Gates actually left the company right. mm -hmm. uh, as his full-time pursuit. So uh, CEO since 2001, he's announced his departure just as soon as they can find a replacement. Mm -hmm. And um, Steven Sanofsky, who is the head of the Windows division, left a while back. Mm -hmm. You already mentioned, <laughs> you already mentioned uh, Dean Hachemovich is moving on from his uh, role in IE. Yeah. Uh, and then we've got the possibility uh, for the new CEO of being from the outside or mm -hmm. seemingly a couple of people from the inside, maybe even Stephen Elop, who ran office before he went to run Nokia and is now coming back. I guess a couple of questions. I, I'm not even, I don't think I'm going to ask you who do you think will be the next CEO. If you feel like volunteering that, that's <laughs> up to you. But... Um, is there, is there any thematic unity in, in the departures? And do you see any cohesion coming in terms of whatever the new kind of lineup turns out to be? Or, I mean, you use the word turmoil. And as you know, I'm a Microsoft regional director, so I try to use more euphemistic terms. And I would say it's a period of transition. But... <laughs> I mean, which is it, really, right? <laughs> With all these changes, 
with all these changes? Are we getting to something that's rationalized? Or, or are we just stirring stuff up? I know. You know, uh, <laughs> I like that. Nice euphemism. Um, I'm, I'm good at it. You are? Yeah. I, I think. Super excited. Super excited. Yeah. I'm super excited. Well, I actually, I'm, I think I'm in a minority in terms of, I actually like the reorg that Microsoft did in July. I see a lot of people saying they think this is a crazy reorg, but I, I really like what I'm seeing. I like the idea that they're going to try at least to break down silos at the company. Doesn't it make sense to everybody here, like one OS division instead of, they sort of like it, the stock market. Um, some people on Wall Street, though, think this is horrible. Um, I don't think they quite understand it, though, because it's, it's a little bit complicated. You know, you have this one OS division now, right? Instead of having Windows Phone fighting Windows, they actually work on the same team. Wow, how about that? It's not as much fun to watch, though. It's not. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, the, the idea is to have these divisions now where products that should be aligned are together, that you have a centralized marketing department that actually does ads across products instead of for products that are competing with one another, I think that makes a lot of sense. And you know, that because of this reorg, different people are coming into power who haven't been in power, like Terry Meyerson, who was the head of Windows Phone, is now running the entire uh, unified OS division. So you know, just like a presidency in, the, in America, you come in, you bring your own people, right? You, when you get a new president, you get the new office, well, uh, officers. I'm going to pursue you on that right. a little bit, because this is Steve Ballmer's reorg. Right. And we don't have a new person yet. So we got turmoil, and what do we have to look forward to? Somebody else bring, yeah. saying, I'm going to bring in my own turmoil? Yeah. I mean, I know. It, how sticky is this going to be? The, well, the board, I'll, I'll just tell you what they've said. The board and the senior leadership team has said, whoever comes in is going to go with this, or they shouldn't come in. So they're pretty much setting it up. If you don't agree with what we're doing, you shouldn't apply to be the CEO of Microsoft. And, and did Bill and Steve get back on the board today? Was it, didn't it's tomorrow. They, Tomorrow's, oh, it's tomorrow. Tomorrow's uh, Microsoft shareholders meeting, and they're going to vote if Bill and Steve should be on the board. Bill Gates, Steve Bomber, to be yeah. crystal clear. Yeah. yeah. So, so that we, should be interesting. And tomorrow also is a there's day. No, there's no serious chance that they wouldn't get reelected. I wouldn't reelected, think so. I yeah. wouldn't think okay. so. Um, but tomorrow's also the day in. in uh, at Nokia, they're having a special shareholders meeting to vote on whether Microsoft should be able to buy Nokia's handset division. So tomorrow's a big day for votes. Um, well, votes are sort of about evaluation. And um, mm -hmm. Microsoft has had a, a certain methodology for evaluating employees mm -hmm. and reviewing them. It's had a somewhat sinister reputation um, it gets called, uh, uh, informally, it gets called stack ranking, which is right. basically like grading on a curve. Yep. Now, when I was in school, grading on a curve was kind of good if the professor was lousy because it meant you could have a low, a low percentage grade and still do well. But what it also means in the Microsoft case is there's got to be a bottom half. Even if everyone on a team is a rock star, well, you know, half of them have to be the bottom half rock stars. And, um, you know, allegedly that was causing some, let's just say some hurt feelings mm -hmm. to continue on my euphemistic path. Um, <laughs> so what do you, what's your take on how that may change the company? Um, I think, I don't know, we could be euphoric about it, but there's, you know, there's probably some, some trade-offs, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so, wow. The whole guard is changing, and we're not even evaluating people the same way. So yeah. where, does, where does that lead us, um, especially with regard to the one Microsoft? Yeah. So in case you didn't hear the news, last week Microsoft did away with what Andrew just described, stack ranking. Uh, all I can tell you is all I got all day when that happened were euphoric tweets. <laughs> And very happy emails from people, many of whom had left the company and said they actually might consider going back mm. now that they've done this. Mm. Um, so stack ranking, you know, I shouldn't totally say, I, I shouldn't say everybody hated it because people who are very good performers at Microsoft actually defended stack ranking. And they liked it. It worked to their advantage. The problem was stack ranking also kind of creates an environment like Survivor, right? 
if you are on a team, you have to plot with all your buddies to say, hey, let's vote him off the island so that I don't get voted off the island. That wasted a lot of time, and it created a lot of um, inner turmoil for people who maybe their teams didn't love them, but they did great work. And you know, so I, I'm not going to say stack ranking was hated by everyone. It was hated by a lot of people. It, I think, was a very divisive force at Microsoft. And the question now is, whatever they replace stack ranking with, is it really going to do away with all of these policies? I've heard from a couple people who said, who've been in the town meetings where Microsoft explained what they're going to do now under the one Microsoft and how this is going to change, that they're worried it's not really going to change. They're worried that this is just a change um, in terms of the curve of, and how you're graded on the curve, but they think that there still might be a chance you could be voted off the island. So there's, I think, a lot, a lot of things to prove that this new replacement to whatever stack ranking is being replaced with is going to be different. At least it gives people hope, though. There was, there was a lot of bad morale around stack ranking. I think the timing of this announcement was very unusual because here goes Steve Ballmer, who's been defending stack ranking and perpetuating it for the last 10 plus years. And now he suddenly has decided it was a bad idea and we're going to undo it. I, you know, some people have said maybe this is his last thing, uh, like almost like granting pardon to people when you're <laughs> outgoing. <laughs> Um, I don't know, or maybe it's meant to try to keep people at the company as there's all this churn and uncertainty with the new CEO coming in. Um, so I don't know why they did it when they did it, but it was a very interesting announcement. I, I, that's, that whole discussion may seem a little bit off the reservation in terms of like how it impacts developer technologies, but I, I think that it created a, a bit of a political... Yeah environment Definitely. and it caused it caused a certain amount of um, I don't know competition not always healthy between teams and um, so sometimes some technologies we were enamored of would be kind of cut off um, I guess I'm thinking the, the the one technology that comes most to mind there would be Silverlight um, you know uh, uh, I'm a Time Warner cable subscriber and Time Warner Cable has, well, they have an app, but that's not available for Windows. But, but they have a web, they have a, a web version. And um, the video, so that can run on a Windows device, but the, the video is all Silverlight based. So ironically, I can only do the Time Warner Cable watch on your device stuff if I go to the desktop, right? Mm -hmm. Metro IE right. won't work on a Windows device. For that reason or any other, and, and, and I mean, given that people reputed not to be huge fans of Silverlight have left the company, might we see it come back a little bit? Maybe, maybe work in the Metro version of Internet Explorer? Please? <laughs> uh, I wish I could be optimistic about this. Uh, I'm not that optimistic about the future because it's Silverlight right now is in maintenance mode at Microsoft. They're going to support it, I think, another 10 years or so. So, I mean, it's a long maintenance mode, obviously. Um, but I, it, it was funny when one of the latest point releases of Silverlight came out, it didn't even have the right version number on it in the documentation. It's like they just don't even care anymore, pretty much. Um, I uh, was looking at a, a Reddit AMA last week that Scott Hanselman on the ASP.NET team did, and somebody asked him, is there any hope for Silverlight, anything? And he just said, you know, it, this, was, this was a true euphemism. Microsoft didn't kill Silverlight, the web did, he said. And um, whether you believe that or not, okay. Well, he's from the ASP.NET team. He's not a disinterested partner. No, he's not. But he also <laughs> said, my advice to anybody building a, an app that you want to be able to be used on the open web is don't do it in Silverlight. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. All right. Um, so you know, that said, that said I, I keep getting tips and rumblings from, and I don't know if it's just wishful thinking or people hoping that power of suggestion will make change. I, I, every once in a while I get tips from people saying, you know what, they're not really going to kill it and there's still some hope and they're going to find a way to make it work in, in, in the metro environment. I don't know what that would be and I'm not that optimistic about that, but there you go. I mean, it. Flash works there. I you, know. You, all right, I'll stop. Yeah. I'll stop. And I I'll really stop now because we're, we're at 745, <laughs> okay. so now I think what we want to do, there's a microphone right there. If you've got questions for Mary Jo, queue up at the microphone. And we'll get to as many as we can. 
a little, a little bit of ground uh, rules here. We've done this a few times before. Once in a while, we've hit somebody who's felt very impassioned about something, and it's gone on for a little while. So it's really my job to shut that down, and I will if I have to. That said, hopefully, <laughs> that's not important. And I got my henchmen right here. Right, those guys. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead, please. Hello, Mary Jo. I'm, I'm, you got it? So um, my name is Carl Shiflett, and my question's around uh, side loading. <clears throat> For those of the people, uh, if you don't mind, I'll take 30 seconds to explain side loading. Side loading is loading in a uh, Windows, our, uh, Windows runtime application on Windows that doesn't come from the store, doesn't come from the Windows store. So for instance, if you're a enterprise, <clears throat> and you would like to develop an application for your brand new Surface, the only way to get it on your Surface, uh, well, there's no legal way to get it there unless you, if you're, uh, <laughs> there, there is a way for, if you have an the enterprise God, volume, is about to go, but if you have enterprise <laughs> volume licensing, you can do it. But if you're a person, like if you have Windows Pro and you've paid for Windows 8 Pro, legally, I cannot write an application for my Surface Pro as a developer trying to learn this new technology and put it on my Surface and use it unless I'm in test mode. And Microsoft even says they track all the usages and all this. Um, one other example was I wanted to start a user group uh, for Boise State University. And so I started thinking, well, what would be my first class? My first class would have to be one on legal and explain me the concept of slide loading <laughs> to the college students. So what's the question? The question is, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> <laughs> and and, I'll, and the reason I say that is because I've logged about it, carlshiflet.wordpress.com. You can go see Rocky's blog. He's got like five or six entries on there. We've been asking for two years. The community has been asking for two years from Microsoft to change policy so that a developer can actually write an application for Windows runtime and use it. All right, we got the gist. Yeah. <laughs> now, before you respond, the other, the other part of my preamble that I left out was that you don't actually work for Microsoft, right. in case that wasn't clear from our snarkiness. So while you might commiserate with some of our frustrations, yes. you're not necessarily in a position to fix them. However, you know, you do, you do, wield a certain amount of influence, so. Exactly. Um, <laughs> what's, your, what's your take on the issue, and uh, you know, what yeah. might you do editorially to, yeah. to change it, if anything? You know, it's, it's good to bring this up again, because I know Rocky, like you said, Rocky Waka is here. He's, he has like championed this idea that it's, why is this impossible? Doesn't Microsoft want line of business apps on their own devices? And they have made it impossible but because of the licensing. I, I kind of laid off that because I wasn't really sure what I could do. And I know the, that they've heard this complaint, they know this is an issue, and it just felt like they didn't really care. But the good part is now, um, there's been some political changes in, in Windows, uh, and also some changes we didn't talk about in the developer and platform evangelism team, that now is headed by Steve Guggenheimer, who actually seems very hands-on about trying to do things to help developers. And that kind of had gone out the window for a while. Um, so I think maybe the time is right to raise this again and just say, hey, what's the story, guys? Like, Windows 8.1 is out there. That's supposed to be a release more appealing to businesses, but how can it be if you don't have line of business apps, right? So, yeah, why not? Bring it up. I'll, I'll write more about it. Sure. Maybe, okay. maybe a post after the new CEO is in place? Yeah. All right. All right. Awesome. I'll send you all the information. All right. You've got yeah. you to you let your, your co-attendees have a chance at the microphone, <laughs> sir. Thank you for being understanding. Um, hi. I'm in the insurance industry, and I've got two questions. Okay. We are kind of input intensive. And as, the, as, as a developer, I'm also kind of input uh, intensive. So what is our device for input going to be in the future? Input intensive. Yeah. I can see the data entry folks trying to, you know, go 800 records a minute there with their <laughs> thumbs. Right. Yeah. It's a frustration. Like, it is. Like, really, what, a, what about, yeah, what about those of us who actually use computers? Yeah. 
I know. And you know, I'm, I'm probably the wrong person to ask this because I am not a fan of touch-based um, technology on the desktop at all. Uh, I, I think it, it should not exist. <laughs> should not exist. I'm, I'm in a minority, I feel like, in the press saying this. I know. Right. It, it, touch makes sense on a phone. Touch makes sense on a tablet. Touch does not make sense on the desktop, period, done. What about on a laptop? I think it doesn't make sense on a laptop. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, I still hook a mouse up to my Surface, which makes people laugh when they see it, but <coughs> it's still the best pointing device. And I, using my finger to try to do something very precise, no. So Microsoft is hell-bent on natural user interfaces, and they think touch and voice are the future, and I really wish that they would put as much attention into keyboards and mice as they are into touch, but they are not. Um, so I don't know. We're, maybe we're in the, in the uh, dying dinosaur era. I don't know. If I may, I've spent a long time in this industry, and I remember when we spent a lot of money on handwriting of this nature. Mm -hmm. A lot of yeah. 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 For those, for, I'm guessing not everyone could hear that. The comment yeah. was, there was there was a point a while back in the tech industry where we were spending an awful lot of R&D mm -hmm. cycles yeah. and dollars on handwriting recognition and yeah. that went nowhere fairly quickly. Yeah. I mean, but that said, you still can use a keyboard. You still can use a mouse. I, I love that the Surface has a real keyboard. I think that was the best thing Microsoft did with their device. Yeah. The worst one was that they charged for it. Yeah, agree. <laughs> Whoever just said that. The worst thing is they charge for it and they charge a lot for it, yeah. Yeah, you can. Yeah. Hey. Next, please. Hey, uh, my question is about this integration of the whole Windows ecosystem, which I think is the biggest value that Microsoft has. And I personally think that the marketing team is doing a really poor job at bringing that out. The reason I say that is, you know, when you watch commercials for the Windows phones, you watch commercials for the Surface, you watch commercials for Windows, mm -hmm. none of them integrate. You don't see, uh, you know, my data going across from my house mm -hmm. to my phone to my surface and back around. Yeah. And you know, I wonder if you, you with this, all this integration of the company, you think that's gonna change. Um, you see, I've seen some videos lately, there's one of them that's gone viral about the, the, the surface, the new Surface 2, about all these things that you can do with the Surface 2, and yet Microsoft spends their money doing commercials where all they do is slap keywords around. And you know they don't show people doing real things. You know, yeah. you know I take my phone, I take my Surface, I, my data is on SkyDrive. You know I move my stuff around. I get home, I do my pictures, I do stuff for my kids. I get to work, my information is there. Yeah. So, so yeah. A, a fractured marketing yeah. effort. Uh, and meanwhile, we have an initiative called One Microsoft right. and a new version of the console called yeah. Xbox One. Mm -hmm. Not many. <laughs> Luckily, you're not in marketing. <laughs> yeah, I, I think the, it is. The bar is pretty low. <laughs> <laughs> it's definitely changing, and it's going to change. I'm, I have faith. I mean, if you see, they're no longer doing the Dancing School Girls commercial. Yay. Um, they now are doing a lot more commercials where you actually see people using it, uh, using a Surface, using things in real life. They could do way more. I agree. They could have. You know, a, an example where you see somebody with technology in their car, taking it to home, taking it into the office, and using SkyDrive across all of these things. They, there is more they can do, and they know it. And I really think you're going to see a lot more commercials, um, marketing literature and materials about that. So I think, I think there is hope. They probably can't do that until they change SkyDrive's name, though, right? right? Yeah, they, yeah, you know, SkyDrive has to change their name because of a legal Did you guys issue. know that? Microsoft's no. going to lose the name SkyDrive. Yeah. So, yeah. They, yeah. they got in trouble with SkyNet um, over in the UK, and they, instead of fighting it, decided to just give in. Yeah. Um, so they're, they are going to change the name to SkyDrive sometime in the near future, supposedly, but we don't know what the new name is. Metro. Not Metro. Yes, no. <laughs> Go ahead. Well, this is a uh, two-part personal confessions question. Uh, part of it ties back to the gentleman from insurance, and that's, uh, you've, you've mentioned on uh, Windows Weekly how much you love um, the RT with the Surface and the mm -hmm. Surface 2. 
So curious about what percentage of, of your work you figure you do on the surface versus a regular desktop. And then the second part of the personal uh, confessions thing is uh, Florida, I, I live in Tampa, we've got some wonderful craft beers. Have you had a chance to try any? Nice. <laughs> yes, so um, on craft beer, <laughs> one of my favorite topics, I'm a home brewer and I talk a lot about beer on Windows Weekly. I do a beer <coughs> pick of the week there. One of my favorite breweries is in Florida, Cigar City. Yep. In fact, I just had some this weekend. Awesome. Yep. I don't know a lot of the other craft breweries here, though. So you guys will have to. Yeah, you guys will have to tell me about them. Um, yeah. On on the surface, so I. This is funny. I I because of what I do for my job, I write stories. I do research on the web. Um, I write all my stories, by the way, in Notepad. I really do. Um, I cut and paste them and put them into our CMS That's because our CMS sucks. Our CMS sucks, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we have to use like a text editor. So I'm like, yeah, notepad, it works. <laughs> it's uh, nothing they don't already know. Right, so I, I have done s stories on my Surface when I've been, say, at a craft beer bar, perhaps, and wanted to write something or post something. Uh, but I still do the vast majority of my work on, on my Windows 7 desktop. And it's because I like having multiple windows on Windows. Yes. I'm sad they did away with that. <laughs> I really, w you know, you can do the split screen with Snap and all that. Now you can have three apps snapped on your Surface even. Uh, but I still just am very used to the way I do things and it's just so much quicker for me to have multiple windows open. So I still do the vast majority of my work on Windows 7. My laptop is a Windows 7 machine still. And I, I would like to just keep that around as long as I can. You're a PC. I'm a PC. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it seems like one of the, the biggest open questions is whether Microsoft is gonna be able to adapt to the pace and the sort of the the style of modern application development. And uh, uh, so in light of that, I and mean, when I've, I've heard you and uh, others talk about how um, over the past year, well, especially since uh, Balmer's announcement, mm -hmm. that a lot has been on hold in the Windows division for new engineering. And to me, that's kind of troubling because in this sort of a critical moment in Microsoft's history, when they need to be moving faster and, and doing more, it seems like they're doing, they're, they're just sitting around and waiting. And is that, am I right to be a little concerned about that? Or is that n indicative of something that, you know, still is organizationally a problem with Microsoft? So the pace of things. Yeah, the pace of things. Can we iterate a little faster? Yeah. And, and what might that have to do with uh, Steve Ballmer's decision right. to say, say goodbye? Right. Right, yeah, can Office learn from Visual Studio? Yeah, so if you look at the different teams at Microsoft, they're all at different paces right now. Um, Visual Studio just put out their fourth update to Visual Studio 2012 in, in the past year. They're going pretty fast, I would say. Um, the CRM team also is quite nimble at Microsoft. They roll out major releases every uh, okay. twice a year and minor releases in between. The, the Windows team, it, it, actually, believe it or not, they are moving a lot faster because they just got their latest release out, out almost exactly one year after Windows 8. So Windows 8 won out one, one year after. The team I'm, I'm a little worried about, I have to say, is Office. Um, we haven't seen anything or really heard that much from them uh, in the past year, although I know they are working on the next version of Office. Uh, they've got some things codenamed Gemini, which are the touch-first apps. I'm surprised they haven't hit beta yet, but they haven't. Uh, so, you know, different teams are kind of on different cadences. And then you, you have to weigh in the factor of there are a lot of IT pros who think Microsoft's going too fast now. Like, I get, I get mail all the time from people saying, I don't want a version of Windows Server every year. No, I don't. Um, so I think you have to kind of weigh, weigh what's too fast, what's fast enough. If you, Microsoft's guidance on this is if you're not afraid of going fast, go to the cloud and they say, we're gonna rev the cloud stuff way faster, and if you look at Office 365, they're putting um, new features into that every month right now. So if you're not afraid of the fast pace and you can keep up with all the new features, then maybe the cloud's more interesting to you. Um, you know, I don't, I don't know how many of you read the interview that ran last week in the Wall Street Journal with Steve Ballmer, but he, the public story is he is leaving because he felt he couldn't go fast enough. 
and he feels like Microsoft's going to be better off without him because he couldn't keep up with the pace of change that's required now. I'm not sure I buy that story. Um, I, I, I feel like he's been iterating pretty quickly in the past year, and maybe it took the pressure of the board to get him to do that. I'm not sure. But I, I think Microsoft actually is making some very big changes in the, in the way they roll out products and develop products right now. I think it's going to take a, maybe another you know, few months for all the teams to get on board, but I know there's a lot of pressure from all levels of the company for them to speed up. And I think it, your choice is you speed up or you get out right now. A few months? Yeah. I mean, could a few be 24 to 36? No, I'm, I'm thinking, so you know, what I'm thinking that has to happen, I'm mostly thinking about Windows when I say this. And, um, I think they have to get all of the Windows platforms on the same um, train right now. Because mm -hmm. look at what's happening with Windows Phone, right? Windows Phone Blue is not till next year. Windows Blue came out this year. So I think you're, you're kind of see them trying to catch up, get all these things in alignment. Maybe Nick disagrees, I don't know. He's making noises over here. <laughs> but yeah, so I think, I think there has to be, there's gonna be a little catch up point and then hopefully they're gonna get more on the same train and that they'll be moving at a quicker pace together instead of all at cross purposes. Okay, great. We have three people left in the queue here and we're gonna get through all three and okay. that's where we're gonna that's where we're gonna end. So I count as two. Even Miguel counts, yes. <laughs> a few months ago uh, uh, I think it came as a big surprise for lots of people that Microsoft decided to cancel the advanced certifications for all the various server products uh, without any clear replacement, do you think they will actually issue uh, a new set of advanced certifications? Um, and if not, how will that affect the community? Because a lot of people that went through that certification went on to write books that mm -hmm. I think did help the community. Thank you for that question. That now, now I'm sort of embarrassed that you know we didn't we didn't talk about that before the Q and A. But thank goodness it was brought up. Yeah, a lot of the certifications were eradicated, mm -hmm. um, as the gentleman said, without any real roadmap onto yeah. what will replace them. Right. So, what do you think of yeah, that? Yeah, I know that that announcement right, was do. very disturbing um, be, because of how they did it. They did it over the 4th of July weekends. They suddenly announced, hey, we're pulling the plug on all these master certifications. <laughs> sorry, guys. Sorry if you're in the program. Um, sorry if you just spent $20,000. Right. And um, enjoy your TechNet subscription. Oh, wait. Oh, yeah. We pulled that, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I think they are going to replace the certifications. I don't know when. I don't know with what. But I saw Tim Sneath, who works in the education side of Microsoft, saying, we are going to do this. But you know what? They should have come up with what the replacement was before mm. they announced it. Mm. Um, I don't know why they did it that way. It's created a lot of hard feelings. Um, they, they've said they think it was kind of an elitist program because it was very difficult to pay for it and you had to come um, from other countries, you had to come to the US to do the, the coursework, et cetera, et cetera. But I don't know, I just feel like it felt a lot like the Tetnet subscription issue. It was like, you guys think this through before you open your mouths. And I'm just surprised they didn't do that. Aren't certification programs supposed to be for the elite? Yeah, I, yeah. I mean, there's right. that was the super high sort of level, definition. right? I know. Yeah, so I don't, I don't have any more information about what replaces that, but uh, hopefully something will, because they've hinted that something will. All right, Mr. Castro in the plural side glasses. Turn. All right. No rants. So I am going to keep the glasses on because I'm going to challenge the both of you to take me seriously. <laughs> and before I ask my question, there's some action poses that are required. So I'm going to do this right now. Nice. And I don't have any, you know, bandanas hanging from the microphone. But you guys can take your picture. Right? There you go. You got it? All right. So Mary Jo, I don't mean to put you on the spot on this, but you are kind of the quintessential Microsoft insider here. So um, what I want to do is follow up on a comment that you made about Scott mentioning that Microsoft didn't kill Serverlite, the web killed Serverlite. Yep. And at the same time, you mentioned earlier, uh, later after that, that, um, that Bomber left because he didn't feel like he could keep up with everything. And there was a time in our industry where Microsoft actually did set the standards for a lot of things. And this is half of a question and half of a more of a call to arms, really. Yeah. Because do, we, do you personally foresee that time coming again where we're not 
as Microsoft developers and as people that are involved with Microsoft and Microsoft itself is not looking to just keep up with the trends of what's going on around them, but getting back into the game and for lack of a better term, grabbing the bull by the horns or mm -hmm. to be more Miguel-like, grabbing the bull by the balls <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and actually start setting some of these trends again, right? Yeah. So for a long time, Microsoft, I mean, for the past three years, Microsoft has been playing catch up to Chrome, right? right. When is Microsoft gonna now start to set the standards again on Chrome? And Microsoft let Silverlight die, or according to Scott, it didn't die. The web killed Silverlight, right? Mm -hmm. But Silverlight, in my opinion, it was a great product. It was a great platform. Who's a Silverlight developer in here? You guys suck. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> so, <laughs> So, it, but you know what, if I ask that question at a large, you know, a thousand person like crowd, ask, I'm going to get quite like a... asking who's a VB developer. If they are, they're not going to read Well, and I asked that question, <laughs> no, and I, I asked that question in my talk, and because of them, I started speaking a little slower. But... <laughs> but, <Yeah. ooh. laughs> but anyway, my point is, is there a time that's going to come again where Microsoft will perhaps, instead of start, stop following trends that are going on in the industry take kind of a more leadership role and start setting some of these trends again. I mean, IE has been lagging behind Chrome. I think everybody in this room agrees that it has been for a long time. But IE, oh, it, it really yeah. is a super, <laughs> it, really it, it really is a fantastic browser. And can IE step ahead of Chrome and actually set those trends and set those standards we again. Get it. And I'm not just speaking, I'm using IE as an, ex we I'm using an, IE as an example, but can we well, do that Microsoft with everything else? Microsoft get its groove back. Yeah. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yep, I do. <laughs> um, and feel, the free was answer, actually, feel free to answer a New Jersey colloquialism. The original question was because you as, a, as the quintessential Microsoft insider, what is your personal opinion yeah. on this? Instead of Microsoft, responding to something like Balmer did when he left, because I can't keep up with these trends, I can't keep up with the pace, can we start setting the new pace, start setting the new trends, that kind of thing? I mean, we, we do have the superior products. We all know here that we have the superior development platform. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We're good, Miguel. Right? <laughs> uh, I, so I'll say I and hope- And on, on that clap- I'll do it again. One more. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that's yeah. it. Yeah, yep. Um, that's a great question. I don't know the answer. Um, I, I agree with you. I know. I agree with you that uh, right now it feels like Microsoft's a fast follower on more things than they're the leader. That's the answer to my question. They seem like a follower. They've always been a leader. Right. Right. You know, I'll tell you what's encouraging me. Um, I, I like the changes I'm seeing, uh, you know, as far as how they're reshuffling the, the executive deck. I think that's good. The other thing that's encouraging me is people like Scott Guthrie, um, who I think is doing a lot of really positive work at Microsoft. Um, I think it's good to see that the people in more and more teams not afraid of open source, but actually embracing open source where it makes sense, but not just capitulating and saying they won. Um, I think it's good to see Microsoft supporting things like Git or Hate and Node and like all these things that suddenly they're allowing their own developers to use in house. I think that's a really big change that can't be underrated. So I see, I see pockets of things that give me hope there. I think there's been, it, Microsoft's just let people who weren't showing um, kind of like the can-do spirit run things for too long. And I think it's really good to see them putting some new blood in, in charge of different things uh, where maybe they can have an impact. So I, I, don't, I don't have anything saying, yeah, I think they're going to win um, and just come in and stomp everybody else. But I'm encouraged. And I hope they do succeed, because otherwise I'm going to have to do Amazon Watch or something. <laughs> La Larry Ellison Watch. <laughs> yeah. Well, I agree. Here, here, here's, a, I agree. here's a question on, on that note, right? We did this two years ago. We did. And we had some informal feedback that we were perhaps a little harsh. We were downers. Yeah, Debbie yeah. downers, I think. So are, are, how are you feeling relative to two years ago with respect to Microsoft's prognosis? And, I'm feeling way more bullish. Okay. I am. Um, I, two years ago, I was really worried about the direction things were going, especially in Windows. I, I felt like... Um, they were just um, stampeding over their 
core constituency of developers and not listening enough. And I think they've realized the error of those ways, at least on that front. And I'm seeing a lot more things happen in WinDev, DevDiv, and, and kind of fixing that split that are giving me hope that there can be change. Very good. Our last question of the night. Oh, I feel so honored to be the last question of the <laughs> night. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so I'm a no. short guy. I'm a small guy. I'm just a developer, and I use Microsoft tools. It's my career. I built my career mm -hmm. on Microsoft. And right now I'm having second thoughts about it. Mm -hmm. It is a platform that is dying, and it needs to be changed. Um, if it's not changed, I unfortunately will have to change what I develop on if I want to be a successful developer in the future. The Apple platforms, the Google platforms, they're here. They're here now. And it's in front of us. And if we don't adopt those technologies or integrations with those technologies, we're going to be second class citizens, even in our own career field. And nobody wants to be second class. Um, so my question is, is, what do you think it takes to make Microsoft the next Google what do you think it takes Microsoft to be the next Google, the next Amazon, the next Apple of all the companies to be that I should be focused on and spending my time and my innovation and my, I'm thinking about creating products and services for my customers, for my clients, um, products I work on. I mean, I work for a small company. There's only five people of us. We just recently split off. Um, and we're looking at new technologies to be able to use and to improve the way our clients interact with the software that we develop. And yeah. it's always a sad story with Microsoft, and mm -hmm. I really hate hearing this story. I've worked with Microsoft for over five years right now mm -hmm. in Microsoft technology space. Yeah. I run a developer group in Chicago. I'm a little bit offended by the way <laughs> Microsoft is running itself, and I'm not here on a soapbox, but I think all of us as developers can see that this is our conference, this is what we're here for, yeah. we're here to learn. And it's just been a sad story, the entire talk and dialogue tonight, is, it's just been a sad story, and I think we need to hear a positive story, something yes. that's different. Yep. And um, I'm not here to be on the soapbox, but I think... And, I, and I'm letting this go on despite my own policy, because you're saying it, I think a lot of people are thinking it. Yeah. Like, I bet my career I on this company, I think that the stock of Microsoft <laughs> might sink tonight because we're losing confidence in the company that we've mm -hmm. trusted to build our products on. So, let me redirect that a little. Have, and how much of this have you heard? And I don't, are you seeing any shift in that sentiment or in that fear? Um, I, I mean, I personally feel a little more positive than I did, especially after last week's launch. Mm -hmm. But this is a question. We have seen people leave yep. the platform. Mm -hmm. We'll probably see more people leave the platform. Leave yeah. the platform, and there's a there's a you know a very pronounced self fulfilling prophecy uh, phenomenon in this yeah. industry, where you know if people lose confidence, even if it's for invalid mm -hmm. reasons, yeah. it becomes valid right. because. It the happens. platform loses critical, critical mm -hmm. mass and momentum. Mm -hmm. So uh, what's, what's your sense of that? Can I add one thing to that? I don't mean it's, to interrupt you, but there's actually been Microsoft employees that have been involved in startups that become multi-million dollar companies. And they've, they've left that and they've gone to Ruby because um, it's been a viable platform for them to choose that. And I'm not going to name names, but yeah. you think that if there's actually people within Microsoft who removing themselves from the company that they've worked with and they've trusted and built their careers on, I think that's some level you're, of something. You're speaking yeah. to Microsoft employees that have left, gone to startups. Yes, they've left, they started their own and startups, with different and they're, platforms. they're not right. even on Microsoft-based technology. Right. And yep. I think that's a lot of concern. That's a lot of room for concern. And I think Microsoft has to explain how they're going to correct this. Well, Mary and Jo's not going to fix that. But right. Let's, <laughs> let's find out what, I mean, her, they do. what her sense of it is. Yes. Yeah. So I, I do hear this from a number of people. Yeah. Um, this isn't a new sentiment at all. Um, I'll tell you a couple things that are making me feel encouraged um, in spite of all of this. One is, and this, this announcement last week got, got quite a bit of play, but it deserves pointing out. Um, Microsoft did a deal last week with Xamarin where 
Um, Xamarin announced that their platform is going to be more tightly integrated with Visual Studio, and Microsoft's going to do a lot of co-marketing with them uh, around their platform. For those who don't know, can you, can yeah. you explain so what Xamarin's um, about? Xamarin's technology lets you use C Sharp and F Sharp to develop iOS and Android applications. So when Microsoft first was dealing with Xamarin, Miguel, and, and Nat Friedman back in the day, they weren't quite sure if they were friends or foes. They're like, oh, we don't want to help our developers write for iOS and Android. Well, the majority of the phones out there and tablet OSs are Android and iOS. So I think it's really smart of Microsoft to finally say, you know what? We're going to help our developers build for whatever the platform is, wherever it is. And in some cases, it'll be Windows Phone. In other cases, it won't. But I think it's good to see Microsoft not sticking their head in the sand and saying, you know what, we're not going to help them build for these other platforms. That's, that's just developer suicide to me, doing that. Um, I also think it's very interesting to see them do this with Azure, too, right? They've got all, some of the new mobile services uh, capabilities they have on Azure, they're meant for developing for other platforms, too. Um, you're gonna see, uh, you are going to see Office ported to iPad. I am almost 100% uh, sure that is going to happen. Um, next year. I'd say 99.9, .9, maybe five nines. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, yeah. Um, and I think this is good. And I think it, it, it kind of takes some rethinking because so long people who've been in the Microsoft community have thought they should do everything to benefit their own platforms and just don't put, the, put, their, own, put their software on other platforms. Well, the new reality is it's a very heterogeneous world, especially in mobile. And if Microsoft does that, they're just cutting developers' livelihoods out right from under them. So why not? Use Microsoft developer tools to build for other platforms. I think that's a sign, a very good sign, um, uh, that they're trying to adapt to the real world. And you can still be a leader doing that. You, you, know, you just have to think about how you can bring your tool, make your tools more interesting, more successful um, on these other platforms so that you, who already know C Sharp and you who know Visual Basic and .NET, you have a livelihood going forward. Deve maybe not developing for what you knew, but at least you have a livelihood developing. And, and the encouraging thing about that really is that, because uh, uh, Xamarin's not the only one, right? right. There's the Unity Games Unity, Engine. Yep. There's a bunch of C Sharp, non-Microsoft yep. stuff. And mm -hmm. I think that's testament to the power of the community. And yep. actually, Microsoft now seems to be shifted by that somewhat. Mm -hmm. So yeah. um, let's end on that very positive note. <laughs> and a big round of applause for Mary. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. And we'll see you around uh, during all the session days starting tomorrow.